So I just got back from a vacation to the Yellowstone and Arches National Parks. While I was visiting Yellowstone, I was able to view amazing geothermal features of boiling water blasting from cracks in the ground, heated by the supervolcano that slumbered under me. In nearly every one of these features was an extensive ecosystem of bacteria. They were comprised of cyanobacteria and filamentous bacteria, cyanobacteria being the critters that eat sunlight as well as having created our oxygen atmosphere, and filamentous bacteria eating the hydrogen sulfide gas that pours from these cracks. Later that day, I went back to my hotel room and read a text from one of my friends saying that the full release of Subnautica Below Zero had just come out. Her and I had been playing the original game together for a while and were both excited to play through the DLC. I had just gotten the blueprint for a bioreactor when my mind made a connection between the reactor and the bacteria I had seen on my trip. I knew that bioreactors were real things and that they used bacteria in their processes, but I had no idea how they actually worked. Then I began to look around at all the amazing technology in the game, wondering at how each of them functioned, and how we would be able to make them in our own future. So how would some of Subnautica's technology actually work in real life? How does a bioreactor create electricity? How does a fabricator take matter and turn it into machinery? Why does diving deep decrease your oxygen efficiency, and how would a rebreather prevent this? Welcome back to Serious Science, and let's take a look at how some of the technology in Subnautica would actually work in the real world. Modern day bioreactors are described as being cultures of cells that live in optimal conditions for them to proliferate. If that sounds vague to you, it's because it is. In fact, during my research I could not find much in the way of explaining how their natural processes create electricity. Turns out I was searching for the wrong output, as the purpose of a bioreactor is to turn one substance into another through the use of bacteria, fungi, animal, or plant cells. These microorganisms are kept in nutrient-rich tanks at just the right temperatures for them to multiply, and stirred constantly to keep the entire mixture at the perfect levels. These mixtures are often also oxygenated and kept at higher pressures than normal, so that the oxygen will disperse through the solution more evenly as high pressures mean more oxygen that will reach every corner of the fluid. Most bioreactors today are used to transform nutrients into biological waste materials by these cell cultures, not electricity. These waste materials can then be used to generate electricity, but would need a separate reactor or burner to do so. The most successful bioreactors generate methane from CO2 and hydrogen, as the bacteria inside them eats these materials and produces methane. Methane can then be burned in an engine to create electricity, or used as a natural gas in other applications. But in Subnautica, the bioreactors are fed various plants, seeds, and on occasion alien poo. In return, they generate as much energy as a fifth of what a nuclear reactor can make. How can plant material create so much power? The Subnautica universe takes place in the late 22nd century, or between the years 2100 to 2200. It is entirely conceivable that a hyper-efficient bacteria, or algae, could be created that would produce incredible amounts of burnable fuel, or even electricity itself, without the use of another generator system. In fact, when the bioreactor is operating, you can see sparks of energy inside the green mixture. If this magic algae is creating a gas, then the upper part of the reactor would most likely be a gas engine that turns a generator creating electricity. But is there an existing microbe that can create electricity on its own? Well, sort of. There are some types of microbes that breathe without the use of oxygen, and can be found at the bottom of the ocean, deep underground, and even in the human digestive system. They create energy they need to live by eating metals in their environment, and pumping extra electrons out of their membranes. These bacteria can be coated over an anode in a battery. An anode is the part of the battery from which electrons flow towards a cathode, or the negative part. This flow of electrons from a positively charged electron-heavy area towards an electron-poor negative area is called electricity. An anode coated in electron-producing bacteria that allows electrons from the critters to flow into a negative direction is now essentially a living battery. These already exist and can produce enough power to light up small bulbs and run calculators. Not a ton of electricity, but still a noticeable amount of power. In the future of Subnautica, this bacteria could have been boosted genetically to produce tons more electricity. The bioreactor looks like one large tank, but could have a secondary tank above that, holding negative charge which would draw the electricity upwards and into the base. So a bioreactor that produces as much energy as a fifth of a nuclear reactor could be a possibility, especially with almost 200 more years to improve on the design. But what about the rebreather? 
How can a device make oxygen more efficient at lower depths? What causes decreases in oxygen efficiency as depth increases? This technology already exists, and does much the same as our Subnautica version. Oxygen really does begin to lose its ability to keep us alive the deeper divers go. This is due to the human lungs not using all of the oxygen in the air when we breathe, especially when this oxygen is pressurized in a diving tank. Here on Earth, the atmosphere is comprised of 78% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and a mixture of different gases like argon and CO2. With every breath you take without using equipment, only about 5% of the oxygen in every breath is used by your body, which is already a small fraction of what the air in your lungs is made of. Divers need to use all of the oxygen inside their tanks to stay underwater longer. Without rebreathers, this exhaled CO2 and leftover oxygen is expelled into the water. As divers descend, the pressure of the water around them compresses their lungs and bodies, making the size of their breaths smaller as there is now less lung space for them to take oxygen in. This decreases the efficiency of rebreatherless systems as more air is being lost than is being used by your body, which still requires just as much oxygen to function on land but is now receiving less as their lungs are now smaller. Rebreathers feed the exhaled gas back into the air systems for another round of breathing. The amount of CO2 exhaled only becomes dangerous after many reuses of the same air, but this is ejected into the water before this happens, while allowing the breather to use up much more of the oxygen in every breath, as it can now pass through the lungs multiple times. This increases the time available to be spent in the deep instead of needing multiple oxygen tanks that would mostly be wasted by the smaller lung capacity of its user. Modern day rebreathers are a lot bigger than the face mask you can put on in Subnautica, but then again 200 years of development may make this smaller device a reality far before the end of the late 22nd century. But what about arguably the coolest technology in the game, the fabricators? They're used to create materials, vehicles, and equipment by putting raw matter in and using what looks like lasers to construct. Surely this technology is still far in the future, more than 200 years, right? The official lore behind the fabricator says this, Fabrication technology is the power to rearrange matter at the atomic level. It was the catalyst behind the great expansion and remains the backbone of the modern world. It is similar to how the matter replicators in Star Trek function, as they rearrange atoms to create food, drink, and strangely enough the glasses and plates that these items come in. Later in the series they are also used to create spare parts and even to separate CO2 from breathable air, acting as a component to life support. They do so by literally creating matter from pure energy, something from nothing. But wait, the conservation of matter, a rule that has been held tried and true by all science other than quantum, which I may elaborate on in a future video, states that base matter, or a physical something like a particle, cannot be created from nothing or destroyed into nothing without needing or producing another particle with equal amounts of physicality. So how would we create something from nothing? We wouldn't without discovering some revolutionary new law of physics to do so. But we may be on a promising path using light itself. Scientists have discovered a way to create physical matter out of only light, or photons. The Bright-Wheeler pair production is a process in which a positron-electron pair particle is created using the collision of two photons, literally creating a new particle using only light. So far, the process has only been able to create extraordinarily tiny amounts of these particles, but the process still works and could be refined in the future to make crystals from light. But this would only create these two particles, and not the myriad of protons, neutrons, and quarks found within atoms. These would be needed to create virtually any usable matter and would not be able to form anything like what we need inside of a generated cheeseburger or a glass of wine. But our Subnautica fabricator isn't using light, it's using materials we feed it to create the things we need. If our fabricator can break these materials down into their respective atoms, would it be able to do what we need it to? Well, it's complicated, but in entirely possible. The most similar technology we have today to matter replicators and fabricators is the 3D printer. Modern printers can use a wide variety of materials to create things, such as spools of plastic filament, rubber, aluminum, resin, and even organic materials to create artificial organs. These printers are fed the needed materials and either lay them down in layers, use ultraviolet light to harden liquids, or melt metals into shapes. There are a wide variety of ways modern printers can create things, but it appears the fabricator builds by layering, as it constructs things from the bottom up. My 3D printer uses a spool of plastic 
plastic filament and a heated extruder, or a nozzle, that builds by layering that plastic on top of itself. It works from the bottom up and can create a variety of intricate and sturdy parts using this process, but the heated liquid plastic is not shot downwards onto the build plate. It is placed there carefully and precisely by the tiny opening in the nozzle, and has done so over a long period of time, and not the three or so seconds it takes to make almost everything in Subnautica. These two prints of the Subnautica knife took about an hour and a half each to make, while the game knife takes about three seconds. Another testament to how versatile modern 3D printers can be, I don't have to just print in plastic. This is made of wood. It is a mixture of bamboo, wood chippings, and plastic. Now that this has been printed, I can sand it, stain it, and burn it, just like a normal wood piece would be able to do. And this one is flexible. This material can be used to create gaskets and rubber seals for industrial applications. Some other materials that 3D printers can use to make things are plastics that change color when exposed to heat, magnetic materials, and even conductive wire, which can be used to print circuits. But we're still a long ways off from the three or so seconds it takes to make virtually anything in the game, with most prints taking almost six hours to make anything useful. Is such rapidity possible in the future? Well, with all things in the future, it's entirely possible. With so much time to invent and refine, these processes could be drastically reduced in time. But can a laser really use streams of atoms to construct delicate and complex items? They could, as lasers are commonly used in high precision tools. Tools even more precise than a physical one. A laser carrying a stream of atoms could be used to fuse those atoms into matter with incredible accuracy, and could even carry multiple different elements at once to create composite devices and pure alloys. This could be done by firing strands of matter onto a surface and using lasers to melt, shape, and combine those materials into useful items. This technology is one of the more far-fetched from the rest that you use in the game, but it's entirely plausible. These three technologies could be possible sooner than we think with sufficient advancements in sciences we already use regularly. I had wanted to discuss the technology behind the precursors as well as the biology of alien bacteria, but these things are based entirely off things not found here on Earth, and are therefore difficult to theorize about. I may cover more about the game if you guys are interested, but for now this has been my dive into the tech behind Subnautica. I hope you all enjoyed the video and encourage you to check out the game if you already haven't. No, I am not sponsored by Subnautica, I just really like the game and am a huge nerd. Thank you all for watching.